Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're able to hear me, right? Yeah, yeah, thanks. So someone was telling, uh, telling you, mentioned just the session before lunch that uh, yeah, it would be difficult to hold all of you. And uh, I trust my job will be still, still more difficult because uh, kind of I'm holding you between you and the home and the road. And, and of course, it should be a long weekend, at least in Bangalore for some of us, it's a long weekend. And we are kind of looking forward for the Diwali. Yeah, so I trust, okay, the concluding session of today on the application transformation. We'll leave you with some thought. And uh, what is this happening within the industry? Is there something that we need to do? So we have been hearing this again and again. There's a need for transformation. So what is this need for transformation? How important it is? So maybe let's put some uh, thought behind this. So before I thought, okay, I was just sitting here and looking at the slide. So I was just wondering, at, looking at this character. Any, any thoughts coming from you? Uh, yeah, any thoughts that... Uh, strikes you when you're looking at this. The first thing that strike, struck me was, okay, of course there's cloud. I was also wondering, is it Diwali and he bursted some crackers and got his hair on fire? Okay, so that could be one explanation. The other thing is, there's a split brain, split brain scenario. Are we seeing a split, split brain scenario within our IT? See, we are looking at this consolidation, things going smaller. We are talking about data center in a box which is kind of substituting this huge old uh, data center. We were looking at how uh, the product configurator got retransformed within an enterprise. Just imagine what if a business had taken a call saying that if we could do so much of work on Salesforce, why not we move the product configurator onto a service provider? SAP is coming out in a big way in terms of offering SAP as a service on the cloud. Okay, what would happen if business starts taking call, why not let's move that to a cloud? And as long as I'm getting a service and someone is addressing the compliance or the security requirements, isn't that an option? Now, in this paradigm, so what is that which is happening? So we, we again saw a lot of need for cloud. So we, we saw why Google requires so much of service, why YouTube requires so much of service. Now, are you able to connect to that? Do you have scenarios in your enterprise which demands a capacity like Google? So I was doing a consulting for one of the top online gaming companies. So they use 30,000 servers which is spread across the globe and we were working on a transformation project. So I thought, okay, I made a big achievement that I could kind of give a future roadmap for an infrastructure like that. Then I realized that Bing and Microsoft, Bing and Google are close to 500,000 servers which is deployed around the globe, globe to deliver the service. Okay, so what I actually wanted to discuss was whether is this, are these kind of scenarios going to come, come to us? Are these kind of use cases or something close, closer to that applicable in my environment? So that was the kind of discussion which I wanted to kind of uh, put across and uh, we'll try to cover this whole thing in the next half an hour session. Yeah, so just quickly. Now, we are seeing the, our complete enterprise. So there may be a, a requirement for defining what is a cloud and all those things. I'm not going into that because we are fairly clear. We are into the journey of cloud. So you definitely have a traditional infrastructure which is getting augmented by a private cloud, which could be a data center in a box, which is a complete end-to-end self-provisioned, self-governed and kind of infrastructure. And of course, you would have hosted exchange or you could have uh, yeah, uh, Salesforce, any of this kind of service which is kind of consumed from a public cloud. So this is basically what we are seeing is evolving. But, but there's a new kind of application which is, which is coming. And this is where the split brain scenario is coming. You definitely have one, one part of your IT landscape which is aggressively getting consolidated. It would become small, small, small. It would go to a self-governed stage and that is what it will be. But there will be one infrastructure which is, which is like this. And just to, again, bring some thoughts around this. So we, we were hearing big time on this Windows 8 getting launched, which has the new Metro interface and all this kind of stuff. Now, are those kind of devices going to trigger requirements which can, which can go into this? Okay, all these new kind of devices. Now, just one feature of, of this Windows uh, uh, RT or the, or the Windows Metro interface is the active tiles. So in the active tiles, you have a GUI interface where the icons are real time. So let's say, for example, if your electricity department is providing you an application and you install that application, and every time you look at your mobile phone, 
you would look at your real time consumption of your electricity. How much electricity did you consume till yesterday? It could be the same with a bank. A bank has given you an icon, you click the icon, you don't even click the icon. You start your phone, your identity is recognized, and it will tell you this is your loan outstanding. Or this is what is your, uh, yeah, your balance which is there. But what is the infrastructure required at the back end for this? So let's say you have 1 million subscribers in the back end okay, who are consuming electricity. So what is the kind of push mechanism they need so that they need to push information to so much of these handle devices. Now all these things requires a totally different kind of challenge which may be very different from the kind of infrastructure that we are thinking we have in the IT department, in the data centers that we have. And it is very similar to the scenario with your big data. Now, you, the, the scale we are talking about is, is petabyte of scale, or, or, or uh, yeah, petabyte of scale, or something which is far more than that. And this would be in a very different architecture what, what, from what we are, what we are seeing today. How, how does you have an extremely low, low latency communication between machine to machine? So quite a bit of this design aspects come into some of those things. Similarly, in terms of, again, we discussed a lot about BYOD and all those kind of devices which is coming. And the other big thing is this, this real-time enterprise, real-time enterprise, real-time solutions, how you are able to instrument everything across the globe. It could be a tap water which is coming in your home where you have, it comes, it could be one of these premium tap companies, okay, which has a processor embedded in that and which could tell you the purity of that uh, water which is coming. From, by doing some processing at the back end. So these are the kind of innovation which is going to come in, in the future. And, and to enable this innovation, the technology footprint which is there is something where, where we are getting very close to that. And so, correct. So this was some, some thought process which I, which I had and thought I should go a little bit deeper into some of these things. And okay, one important aspect is some of the tools that we think about, we have in, within our data center. It could be, yes, .NET, a J2E, or a JMX kind of stuff. This is sufficient for that, but the challenge is totally different. Some of these tools are very different from handling a problem like this. Conventional capacity boundaries, again, as I mentioned, you may never have a data center which could address some of these requirements. And addressing that, the business might take a call that, okay, let me go to a service provider who would provide this complete inform information or service to us. Existing design patterns, so we know all these design patterns which is there. Can I adopt one of this, reuse one of this? Again, this is a big challenge. So this is what is happening within the enterprise. Just to, okay, uh, again, we were working on a large global transformation deal for, for a large steel company. And uh, so this is typically what happens within the steel, uh, steel company. And again, the reason I was putting that is to, to spot an opportunity here, which we might be typically missing within an enterprise. Now, if you look at this scenario, this is the typical process which happens in the steel. Okay, how the rolling process. Okay, if the steel making goes through a different process, finally till when you have the steel rolls which is actually coming out. So, if you look at here, you typically have a plant which is actually built, which can run even if the complete data center is offline. That is the way their systems are built. Some of these PLC and uh, DCS systems. But you will find these things. The amount of log it generates is phenomenal. So it keeps logging every temperature. Like for example, in the steel, at this process, they add oxygen recipe into the steel to, to give it a special quality. But all these things are locked at this stage. But you will find as it goes out, the information is filtered. At the very high level, there's a BI dashboard which gives some information. Of course, you will have certain capability to go back. Like for example, it could be a car which has gone on the road, six months down the line, the brake drums start failing. It goes back, they track the history and if it is fortunate if these people are having a three months ar archive of the data, you might be able to find out what happened. But things are changing here. What happens is typically these people maintain three months of data and purge the data. But what happens is very precious information gets lost in this process. So the new, new thought process is you can never lose information. I would want to go back five years and do an analysis of what happened. Okay, how are the patterns? Is it because if there is a specific weather at that time during the steel manufacturing process, does that create a special effect on the end product? So these things are very complex analysis and this is what is the, what the business is looking at. The next level of innovation from IT, uh, apart from, of course, uh, optimizing and uh, yeah, kind of bringing better PCOs and all those things on the existing infrastructure. 
again, before going to this question, I just again wanted to find out. Like, for example, this yesterday, I don't know how many of you were there yesterday uh, session, where there was a, they were discussing basically how someone can kind of do a behavior analysis of a person by looking at your social media profile, your, your graph database processing, and all those kind of stuff. But again, if you look at, so today, if someone wants to track your behavior in a more, more kind of finite way, like for example, if you have an internet system at your home, and, and you, you, you are kind of researching on which car to buy, you, you may be doing quite a bit of research. Now, whom, whom do you think can actually mine precise information about you? Okay, let me, let me not go, let me answer it so that I can use the time on the voltometer, voltometer here. Now, if you look at the telecom provider, the person who provides internet to your, your place, he can actually do a complete behavior analysis of which site you search, what time you do, what are you researching on, but today they can't do that. The reason for that is your net flow, the amount of gen data it generates is so phenomenal that they just kind of summarize and look at and give you a billing data. But imagine if he is able to do that. It's going to be a paradigm shift, the kind of wealth of information that they have. But to support all this kind of stuff, it is not the conventional enterprise which is going to have that. And this kind of data unable to address and we don't even look at an opportunity. This happens in every vertical today. Yeah, so connected to that is the question which I wanted to ask you. So using your votometer, I would appreciate if you can respond to this. First is whether the complete information which is generated, application, whatever it is, you preserve it permanently online. The second is, yes, you maintain it, but you might archive and put it. The third one is, we summarize up information. We summarize as it goes, and we finally maintain a summarized information. We'll start the meter. Thanks, thanks for that uh, input. In fact, most of the info, uh, uh, customers that we have done analysis, very few situations we have found the first day. Because mostly, even the application which is designed, that doesn't capture the complete information. It captures only the specific fields which is there. But the amount of information it can capture is, is far more than some of those things. Okay. Now, just going, going forward, looking at, yes, so what are these kind of new applications and what are the tools? We mentioned that the tools in the back, backyard is really not sufficient for this. So what are the kind of challenges? Now one of the important things which is emerging is the new kind of solutions are going to be more centered towards data. It is, the, it is based on the volume of data. Is it going to be petabyte of data that you want to do an online analysis of your video? Or it could be just like the steel plant scenario which I mentioned. Or it could be the amount of time you're reading, which, which might translate into the IOPS kind of scenario. So that is definitely one kind of stuff designed for failure. So today, in today's scenario, we have an infrastructure where we design that cannot fail. That, that is the level of SLA which is there. But in the new kind of application where you are doing, let's say, the same logging for a steel, steel industry, it might be fine if I miss half an hour of data for, from a specific sensor just because the server or something which captured that went down. But with the overall scheme of things, that still the value which is coming will be far sufficient for us. The same thing again with if it is you are logging a web traffic or any kind of social media events which is coming, any one of those things. And applications are based, going to be based on cues and messages. See, today we, we write that. So in the typical coding, okay, the kind of pattern that we use, when we write, we finally have an exception handling if the write failed for some reason. And if the write failed, we pop up an error or something like that of the sort. Now, none of these things is going to kind of work in the new scale of things that we have. All, all the real-time real applications. You might have to just drop and, and still go. That, that is what exactly some of the Googles, Googles and all those people of the world. Sometimes you click a search, the server addressing that at the back end would have failed. Okay, but you will never know. You might think it is some network problem somewhere and you will submit it again. It would have gone to a different server and address. But still you feel that service is, is kind of ava available completely. Latency, the way the, inf the your infrastructure is spread across. So today if you look at the global scenario, based on where you are, okay, certain certain kind of location you can get 100 milliseconds. So you, best is you can go for IP transit link, which is kind of one hop onto the internet and you can reduce 
latency, but still you may have 100 millisecond latency, which may be there from end to end part of the world. But how do you handle the transactions in that kind of scenario? A very kind of lazy kind of right approach and refresh and all those things. This is something which is happening big time. Asset requirements. So, yes, so today most of this RDBM is that we uh, think about. So when we write, we assume that, okay, it's a complete consistent transaction. That is, I'm ready, reduced the balance from here, updating this gentleman. Okay, it has to be one atomic transaction. But these things are actually not possible in some of this huge scale environment. And these are kind of, uh, yes, it is good to have, but the, it can be compromised for, for the bigger goals. This is what is happening in these kind of uh, scenarios. Again, it's very easy to put an extremely complex join and extract data using an SQL. This is again something which is kind of becoming impossible in some of these internet scale systems. And you have a lot of this no SQL kind of scenario, like this Cassandra, which is typically a key value pair extract. So I give it a key and I tell fetch these attributes and in a petabyte of data, he just gives me that data. So this is, this is again some of the things which is happening. Stateless interaction. Now again, this is something which is getting quite interesting. I don't know how many of you heard about Node.js. Node many programmers in this? All right, okay. Yeah, so, you know, typically Apache web server, IAS web server, and all those things okay, can handle about 1,000 concurrent sessions at a, at a time. But when you look at the huge scale, again, these are something which is extremely kind of limiting. So you have a number of threats within a, within a processes and the way you handle uh, logs and all those things. But again, things are getting into stuff like this, which is absolutely event-driven program. And in fact, I wrote a small web server which is running from my desktop class machine at, at my home. And I could serve 20,000 concurrent hits from that web server. So this is the kind of paradigm shift which is happening in terms of how some of these new technologies are working. Real-time applications, yes. So how do you have some of this real-time response? Again, so these are, yeah, technology like the Esper and quite a bit of this uh, stuff which is which is coming a big time. Locking, again, challenges with respect to lock. Yeah, so looking at this new transformed enterprise, we definitely need that armored vehicle, which, which is there, which is typically our IT that we know of. But you also need, need services from some of these other vehicles. This is what is happening in the reality today. So today, again, we are believing x86 is the system and we are going forward. But you might be surprised that it might not be a reality because yesterday you might have tracked the news where AMD has signed up with ARM. So ARM is one of the, uh, you all know ARM, right? Which comes in your uh, smart, uh, smartphones. So they're extremely low, low power consumption and extremely good at vector processing. So, and the power consumption of that is 5 watt versus an Intel system which will be 250 uh, watts. And this 5 watt processor, the 64 bit which Dell has signed up, Dell is launching and quite a bit of companies are launching. I think uh, Cisco and all those guys will be launching soon. So that is kind of addressing a very different kind of application. Again, some of the GPU based processing. So quite a bit of this new kind of scenarios which is coming, which we need to kind of carefully look at that to, to see that what is this new item going into. So how do we tap some of this opportunity? So what is the kind of cloud that we, we need to build? How, how do we scale up to that? What is the kind of big data or, or something that we're talking? How do we lay foundations for some of those things within an enterprise so that, yeah, so when when the requirement comes, it's not that we are shying away from that and it is a service provider who is providing the complete service. So, yeah, so this is just taking, taking from that where we discuss about what is an application requirement, so what are the kind of tools which may be required, versus just translating to what are some of those new characteristics, where again we are kind of discussing, we're designed for failures, it may be a very different SLA from, from what we are having. Acceptance of open, open source standards, there are a lot of these tools which was coming in that uh, previous uh, slide which are actually open source, you don't have a vendor, okay, uh, you might there may be someone supporting that, but you may not get the enterprise grade of support. Like say something goes down, you cannot say I'm logging a security one call, please give me a response. It may be at, at a best effort basis. But you do have alternative. For example, for a Hadoop, so you have solution like the Green Plum. So if you, if you actually go to the uh, yeah, stall, you would see how this Green Plum gives you. If, if a set of features which is required for a data sci uh, scientist versus the conventional Hadoop, and also how it can merge with some of the other OLAP features of the standard green plum and make some of these things very easy for you. 
So these are again the technologies to be explored. And yes, how do we set up some of these uh, footprints within the enterprise? So again, coming back to some of these requirements which typically happens is in terms of one is yes, there is an aggressive requirement to reduce cost cutting. We have to reduce reduce cost and all costs. So how do some of these automations? One is definitely some of this converged infrastructure which help big time in, in kind of reducing some of this footprint. But how do you extend that cloud to a complete enterprise? Because you have a lot of this risk machines which is there in the enterprise. How, how do you automate? Because automating some of the fabric layers are, are very difficult. You may automate everything, but you find this fabric which is lying within your data center becomes a big challenge. So how do you address some of those things? So yes, so many of these technologies, the yes, automate, reduce, this definitely is one side of it. But the other side which we said is the exploring of some of these transformation opportunities. And it is important that in this new footprint of, of IT, where we definitely optimize on one side, but we do a lot of internal selling and educate with, within the businesses and community that these are possibilities which is there. These are the areas that we can innovate and increase the scope of what IT is delivering today. So we, we looked at a lot, lot at what are those new, new technologies which is coming, but in terms of the optimization, so what are the kind of optimization which is happening in terms of reducing the footprint it happens in various of these layers. One is definitely you want to kind of standardize technologies, move as much as possible to an x86 kind of platform. It could be a direct, you do a, uh, yeah, a P2P P2B kind of stuff if you already have an x86 platform. Or else if it is some other risk-based platform. So how do you, if it is an application, for example, we discuss a lot about an, an application like a SAP, which is come, kind of coming. So today SAP is available in multiple platforms. So you could always buy a new x system and port the complete data. Similarly with a database. So if an Oracle is, Oracle is lying in, a, in an Itanium processor or it, it could be a P-series processor, you could always put one of these B blocks and move the complete stuff into that. So these, all these kind of standardization, your virtualization, your P2B, or, or in terms of finally the worst case scenario is you might have to port an application. So it, it would be a complete uh, code recompilation or it may be a little bit easier if it is a Java based application. So all this kind of stuff is actually required if you get to this complete private cloud journey so that you optimize the infrastructure as much as possible so that you are able to take out the cost and invest that in some of these innovations which is required. Again, one of the key elements of some of these footprints that we are talking about for the next generation is, I mean, never go for a big bang approach where we want to set up the whole thing, put in a lot of dollars, but it's more good to go in a modular way. Set up a small footprint. It could, if you're looking at something like an Hadoop, Okay, you're setting up a small, let's say, 10 node cluster, but you grow as, as you grow, rather than putting up a huge investment and you might uh, kind of, uh, yeah, get into a uh, issue of demonstrating a return on investment and all these things. Because, yeah, so this is something which is uh, quite crucial. So we, we as Wipro, as a system integrator, so we do have a lot of accelerators in terms of how an enterprise can establish some of these new technologies, optimize the existing a footprint which is there and again when you're looking at establishing some of this new but in terms of optimizing this data center so how do you have some of these architecture footprints so we are talking about data center in a box which is coming from uh, something like a v block but how do you extend that to the rest of the components which could be in terms of yes how do you address power how do you address some of this other stuff which is beyond that like for example there may be a security device which may be well outside this but how do you have it together so today we are talking about software defined networking, okay, which is again becoming a big thing and uh, how do you have again a different level of intelligence by which you can actually control the com complete flow of information which happens across data centers or across the globe. So we, we as Wipro as a system integrator, so we, we engage with organizations in various phase of this journey. At the, at the very, very highest level we help in visualizing some of these things because it's very difficult to visualize that there are opportunities within our enterprise because we have been used to things working this way. But yes, to, to mine out different opportunities can be a little bit of a difficult thing sometimes. But taking that to the next, uh, next level of taking any of those visions that you have and making it a reality. So what is that which is required? What is the footprint that you need to establish? So how does it progressively move up? Then take a 
define the strategy. That, that what can be a return on investment? Do you need to look at it as a return on investment, or it should be some other some other way, some other kind of cost saving kind of I mean, cost takeout kind of model? How how that works? Incorporate some of the solutions. Whether it could be a, a big data solution, it could be a, a stream processing solution, it could be any of this kind of uh, solution. So how do you implement some of those things? And of course, once you set up that, so how do you migrate stuff into that, or and how do you kind of orchestrate that? Uh, yeah, that becomes your primary footprint and you reduce your uh, yeah, infrastructure. And finally, of course, manage and maintain that from some of our command centers which is there or it could be yes, as part of your team working from, from your offices. So this is my last slide. I just wanted to yeah, sum, summarize with what is our, our offerings and also in terms of the thoughts that which is, which is kind of happening around and why we need to kind of pro proactively work and some of the themes of, yes, transform IT business and transform ourselves so that can become reality. So I don't know if I have time for a few questions. Yeah, sure. So there's some time for a few questions. Let me see who is first. I think I'll have to ask a question that will be first out of this room. I think there will be a few, few hands going up. But, but do, you, do you feel these things are reality or it's just theory? Reality. Thanks. You, you might want to summarize the day? Yeah, please. Thanks for that opportunity. I think I can take some time and uh, discuss some of these things. So, again, this was one of uh, this consulting uh, stuff which I was mentioning. I was recently engaged into, where uh, it's a large gaming company, so they have 30,000 30, servers which spread across the globe. And the way the games work is, it's something like a movie, and they spend 1.2 billion dollars in developing a game, and the game runs at the peak capacity of two months, and it starts going down. The, the usage. But what typically happens is they invest in this huge infrastructure and then the rest of the stuff starts dying down. And again you have requirement with respect to big data which is there. And the behavior of big data is very different from the conventional cloud because big data requires extremely high IOPS and you require basically PISA box servers, a ton of this PISA box servers each having some 12 hard disks and that is what builds the entire capacity. So how do you kind of balance these two challenges? Now again, there are projects which is happening today. Uh, so one of the projects which is sponsored by uh, VMware is something called a Serengeti project, where you can have a, a big data solution which is actually running on a cloud. So these are some of the footprints that we are establishing for that uh, customer so that you, they could actually realize the complete benefit of a cloud and a big data. And, and the 30,000 servers which they have, and once we did a complete analysis and including the forecast of what some of the games which is coming, and doing a complete uh, this thing, we, we could uh, find that, and they were running in about uh, uh, about 15 data centers, which is spread across, and about six clouds, uh, providing around five, four thousand servers. We, they could run the whole thing out of four data centers, which is spread across the globe, and that is the transformation which is uh, which is happening. So, and this is again based on some some of the compute power which is coming. So today, if you look at some of the E5 yeah, E5 processor, uh, which is yeah, which is there, uh, like the, the Pi 9 uh, 60 kind of processor. The spec JVB of that, if you look at uh, a, a machine which is kind of bought some four times uh, ago, is some 16 times the capacity. So th without assuming it is getting 100% utilized, you, you get a 1 is to kind of 16 compression on some of these uh, footprint. Yeah, so this opportunity to use Moore's law, Nelson's law, Rider's law, and all these have come in a big way in terms of reducing some of the cost of IT and it is for us to kind of uh, leverage some of those things. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, I think we'll take the question. Hi, Saji. Yeah, hi. Pushpa. Um, a little bit of a longish question, may I? I am open for that. Okay. When Gandhiji was asked to give an example of evil, he said, 
the railway is even. <coughs> so they asked him why. He said because the railway, when anything, when, when an emergency happens, it gives you the illusion that somebody far away will be able to be there when you need him. Keeping this in mind, <coughs> keeping the fact that we are going for big data, big management, UID, keeping that in mind, taking it ahead, where are we going is the question. Keeping in mind that IBM had tracked every Jew and gave the data to Hitler to exterminate the Jews. Where are we heading with giving how much of our privacy is at stake? Are we ultimately giving our lives to the company and this big numbers? And keeping in mind the, the fact that we are becoming virtual human beings, we have all accepted that. Where are we heading? Do you see, do you see any breakers by, by way of law, by way of companies taking responsibilities for their, for their products? Is there anything to prevent misuse, to prevent us from killing ourselves and, and surrendering ourselves to the big companies? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Very interesting question. I think it will be far away from some of the technologies, but I have definitely encountered this kind of questions. Technology is a double-edged sword. It gives X, Y, Z benefits, but yes, so some of these things are big issues. And uh, again, it is country to country. So, yes, comparing some of the problems which is there, like it could be some of this UID project that you mentioned. In a lot of countries, they might not want to give their fingerprints because that is the kind of information which is going out. It could be used to track you, like you are at the airport, you put your fingers and they track you, but yeah, please. Flip side up. So the way the technologies are, go are going today, we might end up in a situation where my complete information, including my DNA, my everything, will be there at some place. So someone will be able to mine. So today, because I've been kind of working with some of these guys in Facebook and all those things, so they have something called this graph database. Like using this graph database, a different kind of database where I could kind of relate. For example, if you are visiting uh, Bangalore, I could find out at that time how many of your relatives okay where where who would have flown along with you okay or, or what kind of the probability of you meeting some of these relatives so it could be used in in the scenario where for example there's a terrorist okay who might be going to a city and within a second you want to find out okay who are his terrorists and who are his relatives and the probability of where he would have uh, uh, gone so that i can i can actually kind of uh, put some surveillance around that Okay, that would be the positive side of things. But the negative side of things is, yes, so you are traveling to that location, but I would be able to kind of profile you, saying that, yes, so you, looking at the graph, okay, this is the closest relative that you have, and you could have gone there. And I could have found out your credit card information, saying that what was your credit card spent. So there's a possibility that you had a dinner with so-and-so person at so-and-so location. So this is the level of compromise which can happen in our personal life. So somewhere we are, there is a dark, area that we are heading to and until some of these happens and how some of this law the governance and all those things are able to catch up with there is very difficult it is very difficult okay to kind of judge where we are going to see i'm not a qualified expert on this but i've got into conversation very similar conversation with, with some uh, very important people and uh, and everyone was kind of going towards this direction i'm sorry if i if i if, if i answered your question right but but that's the reality Thank you. Yeah, I'll just take one more question. Yeah, sorry, you mentioned uh, predictive analytics uh, in the in the midst of your presentation. You mentioned predictive analytics, so I just wanted to know your perspective on oh, what future trends there would be and how big data would be used in genomics or biotechnology. That is correct. Again, this is, uh, okay, again, good thing is, so I have a team which does high performance computing implementation. So we do all this, uh, 
we have not done the complete uh, genomic decode or anything like that. We provide systems which do a lot of these things and especially, yes, so yeah, so having all this genome database and uh, how, how to track some of this gene behavior. And this is again where, okay, the technology options. So one is we definitely think this, again, just going a little bit detailed into technology, X86 system is the right system for all these things. But you will find some of these processes, like for example, the ARM-based processor, they're extremely good at vector processing. So you could have a small yeah, pool of this stuff, which could actually, your complete DNA sequence, it could actually uh, do a complete match of uh, either the AT ATCG, that is the proteins uh, generations, and, and all those kind of stuff. So again, I'm not a fully qualified ex expert on that, but yes, so these are some of the stuff, and I was also tracking some of the research from IBM, where they were, uh, I mean, there was a recent paper from IBM uh, two months ago where, uh, in, in as a as a alternative to some of these digital computers, an alternate kind of uh, computers, yes, which is which can actually uh, yeah synthesize some of this. Uh, 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 yeah, not able to kind of recollect that uh, name. Yeah. That is correct. That is correct. So that, that works in a different, uh, at an ato atomic level, so that it can actually work and come out with a new protein, and which could be your result, rather than all these uh, electrons flowing within a transistor junctions and all those things and producing results. Yes, so there are many, many possibilities and innovations which is far beyond the conventional IDs, but somewhere, somewhere it can merge and uh, kind of give you results. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. It's Thank good you. information. Appreciate your time. A big round of applause for Shadi. Thank you so much. <laughs>